Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Yasir Drabu, uh, founder and CEO of Taza, a product engineering and software development company. Welcome, Yasir. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Well, I, I'm excited to jump into this topic. Uh, as I was telling you before we started recording, that you know, had a a kind of a parallel conversation in another episode talking about uh, opportunities for AI around SMBs, smaller, like the, the, you know, the, the long tail of companies. We're talking today about opportunities for AI in the enterprise. So I'm interested in getting your perspective and having a conversation, but uh, Yasir, I always like to start this way, like kind of, who are you, your background, tell us a little bit of what your company does and where your focus is. Yeah, uh, being a computer geek from <laughs> from the time I remember, I loved building uh, software and then eventually got into product engineering, was on my way to becoming a professor, did my PhD in computer science, but really enjoyed uh, building products. So shifted gears a little bit and started Taza to really uh, uh, enable doing that. We started uh, with a team of three, four in the proverbial garage, so to speak. We didn't really have a garage, but and, but then uh, ended up uh, growing it to almost a 350 person huh. uh, engineering company where we are building some pro uh, interesting products. <laughs> and it's uh, fun to come to work on a Monday morning uh, or a Friday. It's, it's uh, fun every day. Uh, do you work, focus on any specific industries or are you broad kind of uh, you know where the opportunities are? Yeah, we're broad, obviously, serendipity, uh, you know, where you land in some industries, so ed tech, uh, logistics, uh, uh, healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, and fintech seem to have been some of the areas we've gravitated towards, but uh, we've done projects in other areas as well. But these are, we have a little bit larger footprint and domain expertise in these. But, so. Well, it's inter interesting about AI is that, I mean, everybody's asking about it, but what my impression is that most organizations are still very much in the piloting stage. They don't yet fully understand, you know, what they should be doing, where they need to go. And so they're trying things here and there, having conversations about it. Right? So I'm interested to know, like, so what are people coming to your team for help on building? What types of things around AI? So I think right now, I think in the early stages, they're trying to understand how this would impact them, uh, you know, uh, and we've had some uh, various POCs. I think the most common use case is improving customer service, for example, right? Mm -hmm. the, there's a knowledge base and uh, traditional search is great, but being able to summarize that and uh, succinctly and be able to answer a question that's more specific has been a very common use case. And we've, we've actually helped build uh, uh, a couple uh, a couple of use cases where you have a product and then you build a, a chat bot around it, uh, mm -hmm. enhance it with, so you would take a foundational model like chat GTP or others or Gemini and then uh, augment it with their proprietary, uh, you know, uh, application data and then make it easy for their customers to ask, how do I do this? Instead of just pointing you to an article that was manually written, now it can summarize. Step one, click here, click here. It actually generates some of those responses, which are very, uh, you know, very guided and tailored to the question that's asked. Oh, um, and those kinds of solutions have been around for a long time. I remember I was working with a consulting for a company back in 2005, and they were starting to experiment with expanding yeah. their support, their knowledge base. And, uh, and, and so I don't think that, that at that time, they, it was even referred to as like a building a chat bot, but yeah. it was an automated support yeah. tool, you right, know, that right. they were building. Yeah. So what, what this does is it expands that quite a bit, right? So I think uh, that's a baseline. I, I would say that's like the first simple use case. You know, it's logical. You 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 build where you kind of fully understand. But if you take it a step further, uh, you almost get to the next level, which we are integrating with their APIs through the chatbot, right? So now they can say, uh, you know, earlier it would be six menu clicks to do something. 
and now they can say, hey, uh, send a Christian an invoice for $200, right? It's a very basic use case. And it would actually do everything and create that and say, send it. <laughs> so we are working on that kind of a natural language, uh, you know, na natural language interface, which is more easier than having a whole menu driven system or going through six clicks or imagine, uh, uh, and this is probably gonna uh, be very common where you could, uh, have your assistant like Siri and others connect more in integrated into your application where you can say, hey, Siri, and this is on an enterprise app, right? Oops, my Siri turned on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but uh, but then go from uh, go go from uh, go from there. So I think we are building on that uh, from a sorry about that uh, from uh, from a uh, you know uh, we are building up from that basic enhanced version. Obviously. Uh, LLMs have a much better able, ability to summarize and understand intent and from, with fine tuning and uh, embeddings as they're called, uh, you can actually enhance uh, enhance the outcomes on that, then actually make it more specific to that uh, their particular account. So that's one use case. We have about six, seven other use cases that the enterprise is trying with workflow automation, agent-based approaches, which I'm happy to discuss depending on <laughs> where the conversation leads. But, you know, and I was thinking, uh, again, we, to talk about the potential applications for this. I mean, uh, you know, 25 years ago, worked, working for a company where we were building a demand planning for a manufacturing sector. Yes. And so a lot of what we were building, I mean, I could see how this can be automated across the board. So again, if I, uh, you know, how for folks that aren't familiar with that space, it's essentially, um, you know, you, you have a manufacturer of a product and all of their partners that are in the ecosystem, they're tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers that are part of that. They're the shipping, the operations side of the business, all of that. Like if, if they make a change to the product and which might change where the, you know, which materials are used, which external components are used, the mm -hmm. time it takes to build the product. And then, you know, so you can, the, the idea is that you can estimate if we make this change this is the impact to trucks on the road delivering products to stores you know that it would take by making that design change and so you can make decisions based on hey we know uh, this manufacturer went out of business we've got a new one how long it'll take until we're able to ship again those mm -hmm. kinds of impacts which is with cool stuff 25 years ago just a lot of effort to get that information sure and and now we can do that much more quickly. Yeah. 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 I, I think the models are flipping, right? So traditionally you have declarative programming, right? So uh, you would write a program. Uh, we as uh, the programmers would hand code every use case and, you know, write algorithms to solve for it. I think the, the flip, uh, flipping that model around, whether it is, you know, the use case I mentioned was more on the generative AI LLM, but there are mm -hmm. task specific uh, task specific, uh, uh, you know, models that can be created, and then you can use them to kind of uh, get you the answers uh, that you're looking for, right? So you train the models on, on enough data, uh, then they can provide you some predictive answers with higher probabilities. And I think that's the paradigm shift from a programming standpoint. Earlier, you would write declarative programs, save it to the database, pull data, then write some logic and then apply different operational research constraints on it. And then uh, you say, okay, this is what the demand structure should be in this case. I'm just uh, you know, saying, mm -hmm. I, uh, but now the models are, uh, now the programming paradigm is shifting. Hey, we're going to give you a lot of data. Here's a, here's a different programming paradigm where you're building the model and then asking it. So I think that, that it creates a whole new set of applications and areas that you can uh, address. So uh, uh, ten, about, ten, I, I work with a client of mine, they do video analytics, right? They, they mm -hmm. do video analysis, quality analysis. 10 years ago, doing analysis on video is very painstaking. You have to kind of extract the iframes, V frames, then try to do image object recognition and all that. It was just hard work and it didn't work very well to be very honest so they gave up on some aspects they would the areas that they could quantify and parameterize they did others they just couldn't now you can with some of these uh task specific models on hugging faces and others you can you can apply like a large context window and analyze 10 minutes of video and it'll, then you can say is there a 
a white horse running in this somewhere in the scene, it'll actually pull up that right frame and be able to do that. So you can do deeper uh, analytics. Now they're using that for, uh, you know, for content safety and other things, especially with content rating. Hey, somebody doesn't want, uh, you know, their kids to watch something that's inappropriate. This can actually do some content analysis and better rating on specific sections of them and get more granular. Those things are possible right now. We're talking about how to solve for that, which is the model we're going to use, how we're going to deploy it, what's the financial model on this. This would have not been a use case that could have been solved 10 years ago. So right. the AI just enabled them to do this and hopefully uh, it turns their company around and expands their ability to do analysis that's more meaningful and uh, not just not just on key technical parameters, but actually on the content that was hard to articulate just 10 years ago. Well, this is, uh, I know this is a, a, a parallel to this and uh, is a slightly different discussion, but, but I know that, um, I mean, uh, with, when you think of like the duopoly around marketing, which is really Google and, and Facebook, um, uh, to some degree, Apple in there with what they pieces that they own, but where, um, you know, where, you, you've got those, those marketers that are, uh, Google and Facebook primarily that are concerned about the move towards so much video and these tools because it just completely changes the way that people have the ability to go and purchase based on what they're seeing. I mean, we're very close to the point in time where um, with the use of, of AI and understand even in live TV, you see somebody, a character that you like wearing a jacket, you really is like, hey, that's a nice jacket. And to be able to point and click at something and it identifies what it is, it finds it and puts it in your Amazon cart, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And and I think uh, it, this would not be possible just <laughs> five five years ago, right. forget, or forget 10. So th that's why it creates very interesting use cases. It, it creates a whole new set of applications and it does require some retooling and rethinking on the engineers point of view from going from a deterministic to a probabilistic programming model, which, uh, and looking at how other ways to program, but it creates all these new use cases that were earlier considered very hard to solve and you needed a PhD and really, uh, you know, and even they would struggle with it because there was no easy way to solve it till, till yeah. we got to this larger models that can do better, um, you know, a better identification of uh, whether it's images uh, in a, whether it's an image or a video within an image sort of thing. So, well, I'm interested to get your perspective. Uh, I know a lot of um, uh, this is like a real thing too, where uh, you know a, a, a CEO is on a flight, reads the in-flight magazine around something on AI, or lands at his you know team meeting and says to his leadership team, "We need to get some more of this AI stuff." Because of the article they read in in uh, Delta In Flight magazine, uh, you know, that th that actually happens uh, all the time. <laughs> yes, um, but I, I'm I'm interested. Besides just you know companies not wanting to get left behind, how do you advise them on on what should companies be thinking about and doing? Are there kind of fundamental pieces around AI that they should be looking at and considering building, customizing for their businesses? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, AI will. Uh at least from a business standpoint, I'm not going to speak to the broader <laughs> ecosystem. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a broader conversation, but specifically within the business world, I think people should really adopt it uh, for their needs, whether it's, uh, it is from a point of view of how can it enable everyday jobs to be made easier. So mm -hmm. what, what you, if, if they just do a step back, analyze what you're doing in your business and see which parts are really uh, you know, mind numbing and, to, you know, things that can be automated and where humans can excel still. I mean, I think there's still collaboration very appropriately. The, the whole collaboration ideation and being able to, uh, able to create and envision products or outcomes is still uh, within human domain. I think w while, while uh, artificial intelligence can uh, seem intelligent, it it's still based on the intelligence that humans have created, and it's just regurgitating that in a in a better format. At least, at least that's the case so far. Whether it's well, music creation tools or otherwise. So I, I would say stop and take stock. So you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to say. So I, I started my career thirty years ago as a business analyst, and one of the things, 
you know, uh, you know, as an analyst, you go in, you want to understand um, what is the, 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 the business need, what's the technology capability, and here's how the two can come together. One of the lessons I learned very early on was that um, you ask somebody like their requirements, the outcome they want from something, they will give you their, like what they think they need based on their lens of understanding today. You show them a bunch of new technology, the danger there, if you show them all this new stuff, then they start thinking more of what's, you know, a, 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 not so much in the frame of what I actually need. They start seeing all the potential, the, the things that it's actually a happy medium somewhere in between there where they kind of synthesize, I'm using the management words here, but they, <laughs> but they, they, they truly understand of, okay, here's what I actually need here's what the technology can do. And then let's start exploring that. Um, and the really the only way that you can have that understanding, and, and in this case, and I'll make this case for AI is to pilot, to experiment. I don't know what questions to ask yet about AI. I'm playing with it in different things. But um, my point here is that it, I think it's a mistake to only move forward when you have a clear cut answer to this is the ROI of this solution. Like you will be far, far behind your competitors if you fail to go out there and experiment and understand to know which questions to ask to, to better understand how you're going to customize, build unique solutions, get competitive advantage around AI for your business. Yeah, you need to develop deep understanding. So I think given the speed of innovation, it's an exponentially moving fast field. You are either too early because it's not good enough or simply you become too late because the curve is very exponential. You, you know, if, if you're like eight months later and you're still starting to think about it, uh, then you're already, you know, it, the curve might have gone so fast that you could miss that window. So. I, in most of the, I published one or two blog posts and everybody had done start small, start with a team, start experimenting, engage with us or internally, it doesn't matter, right? So, but need to uh, start somewhere, whether it is simply starting to use chat GTP to get some summarization on things, that can be the easiest point of entry, but then thinking how you can apply it to business or, you know, we are advising some cities on how to take AI into the, into the uh, into city government and mm -hmm. make it uh, bring more innovation and services to its citizens and uh, make their lives easier. Make it make it uh, make the connection between city officials, elected officials, and the residents more tight knit as a community. There are a lot of things that can be done very easily uh, because of the advent of AI. But uh, again, don't have a you can develop the roadmap, but start with small. Uh, experiments and ideas that you implement and each one will create an inflection point that will naturally catapult. And then you look back 24 months back, oh, but that was so obvious, right? Uh, but the hindsight is always 2020. So uh, start small. I always say like, even with my, some of the product companies that we're advising, uh, I said, what's a simple use case? One of them, they have a onboarding challenge where uh, the user needs to write a bio or some of the things that they can do. They, usually people get stuck building their uh, menu of services in that product, right? And then somebody has to call them and coach them. I said, why, why ask them for two, three keywords, what they're good at, help, we can, uh, we can do a fine tuning model and let's just simply do an autocomplete and give them three or four summaries to pick from so they can move faster, right? It's a very simple use case for generative AI with the right tooling and some prompt engineering and a little bit of embedded enhanced, uh, you know, uh, 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 domain specific information that that would make that make there so start there once you start using it then you may, oh we could do this in this other area maybe it's the way we re, you know when somebody is in the cart shopping cart maybe we can do this or that you collect all these data points and then you build on that so if you have a grand vision that uh, you know let's flip everything over it, it is a high risk high reward it may work for some companies but in generally you you would start with the simple use case gain efficiencies and insight and learning and the domain understanding of what this could do very much aligned with what you just said uh, and what uh, you know and then uh, then grow from there I, I think that's the right way to do it uh, 
at this point because we really don't know their capabilities. I mean, they're cool. <laughs> uh, they, there's a lot of hallucinations. There's some. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, verbose <laughs> recitation. But yes, there are. Yep. Uh, and and uh, while they say you know it does write code, but it doesn't know the meaning of the code. So. Uh, it can write good snippets. And I, I'm sure at some point it'll get better with more context and more tuning and larger context windows and things like that that people are working on. But uh, it it does, you know, I would say start small. We, we've started adopting it in various areas of the business to help us make things better. In some ways, it'll help us gain efficiencies. In some ways, it'll uh, make our programmers better. In some ways, it'll make our business analysts who work with product owners to analyze the requirement, uh, their thought process or the way they document uh, and the way they synthesize information and organize better. Uh, we are already seeing some of those things. The people are getting better with their outputs. I see emails that are more refined and the questions are better defined. Uh, a lot of those things are happening. So it's already... Uh, we and we keep promoting that in the in our business, and we also encourage others to do it. But then, the next step is how do you take that foundation and then build on it incrementally to till you get to the point of that ROI considerations and all those. I think right now would be the time to experiment and adopt. Yeah, so, I mean, it sounds like uh, it's almost like what you say is that it's certainly true with large enterprises. You almost need to have an AI R and D team. Like build that out there and just that needs to be part of whether you, you maybe you already have an R&D team if you're a, you know, a software development company, but, but even large enterprises, I was thinking like having worked for the phone company, having worked for, you know, these massive organizations, um, there's a lot of organizations. I, I work in, with, around collaboration technology. So a lot of the people that I know that I've connected to are, like, are part of large organizations in the modern workplace team. So their job is how do we make sure people have the right tools and are the most productive? So collaboration, communication, productivity. You think of Word, PowerPoint, those kinds of things, but you know, Teams versus Slack versus whatever the tools are, yeah. we want people to work more closely together. That might be the team that also takes on the ownership of that R&D function, the experimentation with AI. Yeah, yeah. So I think the larger enterprises who can afford to have their own R&D teams, great. Where they don't have that expertise or need the help of companies like ours, and I'm not just saying me, but there are so many others that can help. Uh, but either way, I think making some small bets to make sure that you are, uh, you know, you are thinking about the future of work, right? So yeah. you really want to see how you work. Even if we look back 10, 15 years, the way we used to work 15 years ago versus what we work now is significantly different. And with AI, it's only going to get uh, further. Uh, yep. It's going to be a lot. Uh, it, a lot of things are going to change, and there's going to be a different world in five years. And the new generation that's coming into work would maybe consider <laughs> some of the tools we use today archaic because they, you know, why do we have to struggle with Zoom to figure out how to connect when my when my personal AI agent can take care of scheduling, and right. when the meeting comes on, make sure, you know, there's a lot of things that are make them more productive, so they focus only on the parts that matter the most i'm waiting so much for that because you, again you have these uh these you know single solutions that do yeah. cool things but i want them to connect and talk to each other i mean i'm I, you know something as simple as uh you know even how chat gpt uh, it used to be you go in you, you'd have it define an image but then you'd have to open up dolly to create the image now you have the ability for it to call upon other uh, AI APIs and leverage that and do more complex tax, tasks. Yeah. So it almost, it's that service bus model where the, the natural language AI can go and draw from those various tools that you have added and configured in there. Um, Cause I, I want the same thing. Why? I, I just ran into this issue. Like I use for calendaring, I use Calendly and there's reasons for that. There's Microsoft has bookings and other things that are strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses of each. And Calendly is the tool that I've selected. It's the most robust there. But I run, I do a couple shows where I am a co-host. There is not a calendaring solution for two people in two different companies that we can both opt in, give it the rights, the right. permissions to do that, and then schedule it for our two disparate calendars. 
Why is that missing? Why can't AI do that? And then schedule it for both of us. Right. And, and it is coming by the way. We, we, interestingly, we were just talking to a AI startup that exactly does some of that stuff, but uh, it is a hard, harder problem to solve uh, uh, right now, but it, it does, right? Ultimately, I think every business owner or anybody professional would have their own AI uh, assistant, whether that, whether you want to call it productivity assistant or others. I know uh, Copilot is one uh, that comes through Microsoft, but imagine that that transcends the boundaries of a particular platform, right? right. You 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 would eventually get this on a holistic level, and I think like Mike, uh, while Microsoft and others are suited to do that, and I think there is going to be one uh, from. I think Apple is probably the most well poised to do that in some ways, uh, just because of the way they are set up. But they have a very closed ecosystem, which they'll right. have to eventually open up. Right. I mean, they have to fight. They'll have to come up, uh, really become that collaborative partner. I think Microsoft made that transition eight to ten years back to stop pushing Windows into everybody and try to push right. their tools. No, I, they, and a lot of credit to Satya Nadella. Uh, CEO for make pushing for that change because I remember the speech when he just became CEO and talked about it. He said, "said We're going to create the best software in the world, and where we're not the best or we don't have a solution, we need to be the best at partnering with the other solutions." And then he went on and talked about again, this is paraphrasing here, but that you have to co companies that build solutions and provide services have to think of it in terms of the customer and what they're trying to do end to end. And you may own this piece and this piece, but they have to do all those other things in between. And if you are making it difficult for them to connect, to integrate, to, for them to get their work done, guess what? They're going to go with another solution provider out there. And so it's to the benefit of all of us to figure out how these things work together. That's why, I, do you see, do you envision around AI um, that there, there's going to be like some global standards body, like pulling together, like how these things communicate. Because I, I was on a, a, a subcommittee for the Global Grid Forum. I participated in the, the finance sector, the NACHA, um, you know, panels mm. and, and groups around that. And so I've been part of these different, you know, uh, uh, cross competitor industry standards bodies. Do you see something similar happening around AI and getting these things to work together? I believe so. I, I think, uh, first of all, I think the biggest one will be around AI ethics and safety would yeah. be probably the first one. I think the interoperability <clears throat> is uh, coming through some of these libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow and others. They're already ve uh, very much uh, within a standard and the LLM models that are dropped and things that are doing through hugging faces, there seems to be a community-based consensus on how some of these are best stored. Ultimately, there will be protocols between AIs to talk to each other through some sort of machine language exchange. And they will, as you said, Nacha and other formats, there will be some yeah. sort of, uh, so, uh, some form of that uh, happening. So uh, AI agents can chat with each other in an efficient manner, whether that's uh, a binary JSON or who knows which format that it's going to end up being, but there's going to be some conversation capabilities that are going to be standardized and they can exchange uh, just like service discovery and things like that. They could exchange capabilities and uh, things like that to build a, bro a broader consensus of, hey, I can take care of scheduling. I can, you know, I can book a ride for Yasser or I can get his flight information. And then it comes up just like, uh, uh, you know, what they're calling large action model or large matting models. So there's going to be a combination of uh, intent and uh, other areas. This is on the personal front. And similarly, services provided by businesses will have uh, a similar kind of services where my hope is that they are uh, they're providing better quality of service. And, you know, we, we, we've known that there's only a few companies that get five-star rating, others suck, but can, can, and mainly it's not because they want to be bad. It's just that they are resource constrained. Right. So can AI make them resource rich? Can a right. small business really provide customer service 24 seven, which is right now in the purview of a larger enterprise that can afford it because of their price points. 
if some of these things can be enabled, you start getting better outcomes from different businesses for their customers, higher customer satisfaction. Hopefully there's a, you know, people don't then go to the bigger companies for better service. They just stay with the customer, you know, with, right. with smaller, the, it, might, well, it might create the impact. Well, the, the portions that because they might have it more uh, deeply integrated, it might be more personalized for their business, for their industry, for their customers. I mean, but it'd be great, again, if the system... Uh, to some degree, um, you know, became, you know, self-aware of these ser various services, understood those components. And so if, if in a, you know, public system, it, it becomes aware that, hey, there's a better component, somebody built a better piece, that would be a closer fit for what you're trying to do and make that integration and swapping out components and services. Uh, of course, and I, and I know, it, and you slightly it smiled, there's smirk there as well. And as I'm, here's my joke part. Aren't we just paving the road to Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> which is which is obviously on everybody's mind, right? Yeah, right. Are, 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 are we going into a Wally-like future where we just? <laughs> hey, I very much. I want to just be plugged into the into the uh, you know into the matrix. Into I want to be matrix. blissfully unaware. That's that's fine. You know? So yeah, but there, uh, you know the the I think Matrix was the first movie that uh, you know really touched on the size and scale. that's why it, i think it became such a cult uh cult favorite and uh but, because it's but, the truth we are in the matrix that's why <laughs> it hit home no but i but you're right no because it hits it touches on that point no and i think you made the point too that the fact that you think that a lot of this will be driven um you know by the 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 ethical use of ai conversation this is the again 30 years in tech this is, and I'm, and I'm a governance technology guy for a lot of what I focus on is like, how are we using it? How best do we manage it and keep, have oversight of that? And so um, security and ethical use of technology is, is a core part of overall governance, uh, IT governance. And the fact that um, so quickly at the beginning of this move of this shift towards AI, um, every huge company is like, yes, this is important. It's up, it's up front for the first time. Usually it's an afterthought that comes after it's like, we're already cutting down all the trees and we'll figure out what, what we need to do with the wildlife that used to use the forest. Um, you know, it's at the beginning where we have people that even Elon Musk saying, Hey, there's some re good valid reasons for putting the brakes on a little bit, slowing things down and better understanding what we're doing before we do it. And so I think that's healthy. I'm on the gung ho, let's go, let's push, let's go as fast, let's learn as much. Um, but I appreciate that there's a that balance, that there are those people um, that are 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 asking those questions, you know, ethics. It's a it's a much healthier dialogue than I've seen with past, you know, uh, 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 technology booms. Right, right. Uh, I, I, th I think there, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, creating that pathway for uh, uh, some some sort of standards and uh, controls, I, I really believe that there has to those conversations need to be healthy. I think it, it's not going to be humans versus AI for a long time. Uh, ultimately, they need to run on these expensive graphic cards, right. which if we stop producing or we turn off the electricity on them, the AI model is not going to work on by itself. And it's right. not going to, there are some movies that <laughs> that figure out how to do that. I still think we can unplug machines. Yeah. And I did, did, Sam, <laughs> did Sam Altman get his $4 trillion or whatever he wanted to go and build? <laughs> You know, that, I don't, not, I don't think not, so. Not yet, but yeah. Not yet. Uh, yeah, I think that he 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 he's just talking about the scope of uh, a scope of that. I think the, the some of the CEOs take the approach that we just have this one model, right? So, uh, I believe computer science people will figure out better ways to run AI more efficiently using, you know, it started with, you know, rec uh, neural nets, reacting neural nets, and then we went into transformers, which were paralyzed, and right. now we we have, uh, you know, we we did basically the same thing we we traded off uh, slightly different with space constraints and we moved to mamba and there's some new models like jamba that have come out which are even faster in some areas and but using a much lower energy footprint and i think the research will continue till they really 
it, it is it is like the mainframe days of <laughs> computers, right? So ultimately, yeah. it's going to come down to that phone with a neural chip, which will have most of the AI on the chip. Uh, it, it is even it eventually going to happen uh, to, uh, you know, uh, and then you, you have your personalized AI to help, help do that. And it, when it comes to businesses, I think in the next five, 10 years horizon, it, it's hard to predict that far out, but at least in the next few years, uh, you, there's going to be a lot of innovation, whether it's in life sciences, material sciences, there's a lot of challenging problems that were hard to solve, right? What are the right molecule combinations to build something? What is the, so th there's going to be innovation because of AI, uh, then just future of work, how we do work. I mean, do we really want to sit and do some of the things that we do today at the desk? They're not the most entertaining, you know, replying to emails, cleaning your email out of all these non solicited <laughs> So there's a lot of, a lot of non-work that happens. Could, I, could we could we enable the age of four days work where you can really enjoy three days with the family? I mean, that's a big yeah. question. Uh, yeah. We were never designed to sit in the office five days a week, 10 hours a day, right. uh, well, you know, that, so there's a lot of those things. That has been, that's a great point because it's another topic that came up with, again, again you know, I jokingly say a lot that, uh, you know, no one ever talks about the positive aspects it, of the pandemic. Um, but the reality is that um, uh, a couple things that came out of the pandemic were one, for a lot of organizations that didn't think that they could ever do hybrid or fully remote, they're like, hey, we could actually do this. Um, yeah. Two, that they, that the idea of that burnout and and we're not just continually asking demanding uh, of our employees that there's a cost a human cost to that that the uh you know so the whole uh employee experience you know the exp or xp depending on the vendor selling you a product um but that space of looking at truly not just paying lip service to work-life balance but you know what are we actually doing to our people and the idea that is taken root is that happier, healthier employees are long-term more productive, more innovative, um, and provide more value to a company. And so that's that balance. We want people to be productive, but we want them to be happy. Um, right. And so, right. yeah. So uh, I love the idea of the one company I worked for in the mid early nineties, um, EDS, if you remember that. Yes, I do. Proso <laughs> company. Yeah. So EDS, and we had a four day work week. I had Wednesdays off. It was awesome. Going to a movie <laughs> at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. There's nobody in there. It's fantastic. Do all your shopping, get all your services, your stuff done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are positives to this. And I think, and we will, uh, you know, as long as uh, we think about humanity as a whole first, right? Uh, there's going to be. Uh, the human nature of greed and other aspects that are, will want to harness this for the maximum outcome, whether it's for some venture capital investment looking for a hundred x return, versus versus if if there's a balance uh, uh, towards how we how we cater to humanity and nature. I mean, we need to take care of uh, our planet, and this is probably while we uh, we all believe that there's a multi-planetary uh, systems out there, but they're light years away and we have no way to get there yet. Yeah. And so we have to take care of this. I know we can go to Mars, but I, it's not very appetizing. I love the lakes around my house. <laughs> they're beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah. so taking care of, so I think AI can help a lot of those things, right? Imagine uh, adding efficiencies to some of the, uh, uh, some of the pollutant, uh, polluting manufacturing companies to be more uh, energy efficient you know, uh, coming up with uh, better materials for, uh, you know, whether it's improved, solar has gone up so much that, you know, they've, they're starting to outperform uh, coal and traditional energy sources significantly. And then if we can make that even better by a factor of two or three, we are, we are there. Uh, maybe it can help solve some of the most challenging problems of fusion around the materials. Uh, if it can help uh, with the right task models. I'm not saying it's a panacea, it's not a silver bullet. It needs to be trained and it needs to understand all that. But uh, on some of the larger scale problems and some of the smaller problems, right? Uh, we, we shouldn't be paralyzed by the fact that 
it can solve some grand problems. Start small, you know. Can yeah. it can it can it run my home efficiently? Can it can it run my business efficiently? Can it can I make my employees' life better? To uh, they have a better quality of life. Maybe we go to a seven-hour work week and uh, instead of eight. Uh, maybe people can go home at four or three thirty when their kids are out of school. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of things that can be good. Uh, uh, Time will tell how it gets utilized and how we, as humanity, let it grow as another innovation. It's a two-sided sword. So, yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of. I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, you know, there is the, there is always the tendency to abuse technology. But overall, we all were worried about the internet. But I think it came out uh, to help everybody. And we, you and I are having this conversation that, 15 years ago, would not have been possible. And but it has its negative sides, like uh, overuse of social media addiction to the dopamine kicks that you get right. watching to YouTube yep. shots. Those kind of things are also there. So we just need to find the right balance. It's great. I think at a certain age, like you know, getting into middle age, it's it's <laughs> good thing about middle age is I stopped caring about a lot of that stuff. So it's like, yes. I, you know, the dopamine rush is like doesn't have the impact it did yeah. you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. But yeah. but I am so going back, you know, kind of different form of the, the, the question. I mean, given um, your, your focus and what Taza focuses on, what you're working with clients are, are there obvious areas like you talked about going piloting and experimenting? Where any suggestions on where an enterprise should go and look at first? Like, cause I, cause the one thing we talked about right at the beginning, uh, I think there's some obvious benefits as a marketing guy. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of the most uh, uh, obvious solutions to experiment are around improving around marketing activities. What other areas are you working with companies on? Or where do you suggest that they might start looking at how they can automate with AI? Right. I think uh, anywhere there is drudgery and work can be pushed to automation, right? So uh, whether it's uh, implementing SOPs, we, we all love processes, but following them and keeping statuses updates, approval updates, summarizing meetings, taking, I mean, for example, uh, there's so many smaller use cases you can start with, right? So we've heavily leaned on AI for our product discussion meetings. We have, mm. uh, we use a tool that uh, that summarizes all of it, then our product people then take some of those notes and convert them into proper user stories, organize that information better. They make sure uh, they don't miss anything from the meeting. Earlier, we had somebody taking key notes. I'm like, as you take key notes, you're not paying attention to what's being right. said. So you're, yep. you, you, it, that's that's a very small use case. And there's a product out there and good kudos to them for doing that job. And those are those are some of the areas that you can really start with. Uh, always, uh, I think the simple way is to, uh, when you're working on your business or you're thinking about problems within your business department or business unit, is to just sit back for an hour uh, with a cup of coffee and uh, think of what is meaningful work and what is not, and what can be, uh, what, what would make my team better and happier, right? Uh, I always say, I love to keep my dad, Team happy because happy coders produce better products any day than an unhappy coder. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, can we keep our team uh, enthused, happy, uh, and give them the kind of uh, and you get the productivity gain as a business. You're not uh, self-help. Uh, businesses are there to to uh, you know drive some outcomes and have profitability and generate revenue for themselves and uh, for their stakeholders and for the all those things are true. But can that be done? Uh, without being uh, the drudgery of uh, a mundane work and fo uh, focus the teams and their and the people who build those things to better outcomes. Uh, uh, you know, whether that is uh, more higher level thinking or simpler workflows, uh, what does the future of work look like in three to four years? And when you reflect on that and then, then do not get paralyzed in analysis paralysis, but start small, right? right. Okay, uh, yes, this is a grand idea, but let me start with, that recording of the meeting, which is unnecessary for somebody to, I don't need somebody to take notes and not pay attention to the meeting or somebody to do X uh, within, within a product ideation. There are simple steps that can be taken to make life a lot easier. Eventually we'll get to agent driven programs and things like that, that'll help personal productivity at work and home. Uh, but you can really start very, very small. There are a lot of resources available online. I mean, YouTube is flooded with good tutorials. There are a lot of intelligent yep. people. They can start 
with simple YouTube videos that a lot of intelligent people stop uh, talk about, not, not from an academic standpoint, they can focus on the application areas and how people are using it just to expand their eyes. And there's so many articles that are being published on. Yeah, various well, I, I always comment that it's all it, these Instagram videos where you've got the, all these, uh, all air quote, influencers um, <laughs> that talk about like, hey, here's five AI tools that you need to know. And they'll like different. And, and so, and I'll go, I'll watch some of those and I'll go check out the various tools and maybe in the, the grouping that they intended with their scenario um, or might, you know, again, because I'm experimenting with these different things and trialing them, I might find one here and there and work them into my way of thinking. But I think it goes back to, if you're not experimenting, like you, you're not going to know which questions to ask that could lead to the future innovation. I'm not using these little tools today thinking, Hey, this is the this is it. This is the end all be all of yeah. how I'll automate. It's, it's more that I'm just trying to understand, keep up with in my area, my focus, you know, what is out there, what capabilities are, are there because it's going to be two, three generations of those tools later where it may finally click. But again, I want to, I want to be able to take advantage of it instantly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I think the, when I, I think I was talking in another to somebody else, and th there's that amazing book on growth mindset, right? It, I think people need to take fair away out of the equation and, and the noise, and then just go experiment for themselves, and that's yeah. what would exactly spark that. So having that growth mindset is very important for us to, as humanity, to thrive with, you know, with this enablement, right? I, I call this AI enablement for now. Um, Time will tell <laughs> whether yeah. we are in the matrix or not. But for now, well, at least, it's a, it's. There, I think there's a lot of positives uh, if we are cautiously optimistic. You know, there, there, it can be abused badly. It just, you know, the, if you use it unethically, whether it is fake voice synthesis or you know all the scams that can just social engineering scams, it can amplify it tremendously. And uh, it's almost I direct tell everybody, hey, have a key safe secret word with the, your loud and trusted ones because somebody can synthesize my voice and call yeah. you and say something that's not true. So yeah. and if, if you see some outlandish request, I'm calling you, my leg is broken, wire me $20,000. Uh, yeah. First ask well, me for my safe word. <laughs> no, that, I, that's a great, uh, that's a great point. I, I've actually talked about with my with my kids uh with my wife like yes. um and i just keep saying this again this is the uh, um you know the 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 security uh uh you know owner of me the, the program owner is like uh -huh. never never click on a link in an email never yes. click on a link in a text like never if you get yeah. an, a warning if you get a message go and verify like i i'll look at if a message came in i wouldn't take that from my wife i would call my wife as a did you send that message is that actually you? I mean, you have to be cautious, you know, these yeah. days. Um, but, uh, you know, thankfully, again, maybe call it middle age where I, um, yeah. I never answer my phone. <laughs> I don't I, respond I, to texts. I, you know? uh, I, I mean, I, I do for clients. Uh, unfortunately, I was distracted for a second sure. talking to you. Yeah. And I apologize. But, uh, but, yeah, a phone picking up the phone usually it takes the last person. <laughs> you know, right. it's the last it's, thing you do. No, it, it's uh, I, I within reason around that for the same same reasons. You know, clients call or whatever. You know, look at that. But um, but I think it, we do need to be more cautious and uh, um, uh, but but yeah, we have to be open to experimenting with um, the various things and just continually learning. I mean, that's healthy for our brains anyway. Um, yeah. to continually be learning. And one of the things that I do um, as well is you always have as much of a technologist and a, and a marketer that I am, I always have something that I'm reading that I'm doing that has absolutely nothing to do with business, whatever. Like the mind needs a break from yes. that. I'm a science fiction fantasy. I'm a Lord of the Rings guy. Like that's yeah. my break. That's And, and <laughs> I will often break away from that and with everything that I'm going on thinking about that I'm doing and go do that, something different, be reading. And then suddenly have like that aha moment of, Oh, I need to go do that. It, and because I, I, I free up my brain to be able to go and process that stuff in the background. I don't, yeah. I don't pretend to know how it all works, but it, it works. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, again, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the, uh, 
uh, you know, computer science engineer who's, who's writing the activation function or the, you know, uh, the convergence or uh, figuring out how to increase the context window, but uh, understand the broader principles and uh, uh, deep enough to um, be able to apply it for various use cases, right? Yeah. So, so hope, uh, I mean, there, I, I still think cautious optimism, uh, start incrementally small. And then if you don't have an R&D team, people like us are always there to help. <laughs> yep. Well, that's, and that's a great way. And I appreciate that. Um, I really enjoyed having this conversation, uh, you know, certainly thought provoking and hopefully, um, you know, people get some, you know, get something out of that. And, but I always like to, to end this. I mean, obviously your company provides these services can help. So uh, how do people reach out? Where do they find you? What are they, which they, where are you most active in social to reach out right. to you? Right. Uh, obviously, the website is a great place to start. It's taza.com, T-A-A-Z-A.com. Yeah. We are on LinkedIn as well. You can just look up by the same name, T-A-A-Z-A, as you said, Taza. Taza. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, yeah, it means like fresh and a yeah. lot of energy in it. So, so that's the, uh, so we, you can reach out uh on both places and we get back to people very quickly. So, and then see how we can help them uh, if, and if there's a fit, so. Well, awesome. Well, yes, sir. Really appreciate you for uh, being a guest here on the Cloud Talk podcast and hope to connect, stay connected and let's talk soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this. It's amazing. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.